Welcome to this Summer Sabbath Sunday here at First Presbyterian Church. I'm Danny. And I'm Connie. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Here our first lesson from Matthew 13, beginning in verse 24. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared with someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was asleep, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the, the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go out and gather them? But he replied, No. For in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, collect all the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat in my barn. And then skipping down to verse 36, then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil." The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out all of his kingdom, all collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers and they will throw them into the furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone who has ears listen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is taken from the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the book in Rome. We are in chapter 8, love chapter 8 of Romans. I know many of you do too. We are in verses 12 through 25. Listen for the word of the Lord, Romans 8, 12. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit, that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so that we also may be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. 
And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we know that 2020 has been a struggle and a challenge. We know that there have been so many layers to the onion of what we have to deal with what we get to deal with and what we must deal with, that so far in this year we have been overwhelmed and overrun. And friends, I'm sorry to hit you with one more significant issue we're all going to have to deal with. It has to do with hope. Paul talks about this. We'll get to it in a little bit. But I'll, I'll just read you the press announcement. After nearly four decades, Christian Alfonso is saying goodbye to Salem. The actress who's been playing Hope on Days of Our Lives since 1983 will not return to set when the NBC soap returns, <coughs> excuse me, production in September. Take a deep breath, friends. In through the nose, out through the mouth. Turn to someone near you, give each other a hug, we're going to be okay. Alfonso has played Hope on the soap opera since 1983. I think I was a freshman in high school. With the exception of a few breaks from the show, she left in 1987 but returned for a few months in 1990 for a storyline that concluded with the entire town believing that she, Hope, had died. But she returned again in 1994 as Gina, a woman who has, everybody say it with me, every soap character gets it at one time or another, amnesia, who looked like Hope. Of course, Gina was actually Hope, but was brainwashed by the villainous Stefano de Mira, whom she later killed. The actress herself says, Days of Our Lives has been a vital part of both my personal and professional journey. The actress said in a statement last Monday, I am forever grateful to NBC and the late Betty Corday, who took a chance on me many years ago and changed my life. I've built some lifelong friends with my extraordinarily talented castmates. Days has been one of the hardest working crews in all of television, many of whom have become part of my extended family. I feel blessed and honored to have been invited into people's homes over three decades. Interesting. Now, Days of Our Lives has always been around in my life as my mother and sister watched it when I was a kid. When we would go see my grandmother in New Orleans, she would make us watch it and we were trapped and had no choice. And interestingly enough, even in graduate school, we would all gather to watch and kind of make fun of like you might a, a modern uh, Hallmark movie uh, about, you know, don't go in there, he's cheating on you, that's not Gina, it's hope she has amnesia. Now, before I completely lose my man card in talking about soap operas, I grilled yesterday several different meats, so I'm hoping that kind of balances out. But they're losing hope in fictional Salem, Illinois. Hope is retiring. What Paul talks to us about today in the midst of this Roman passage is just the opposite to make sure that our hope is not lost and our hope doesn't retire. Let's take a look. In Romans, love Romans, one of my favorite books, just a great book to study. 
Paul is, well, and a lot of good things going on here. But one of the things that draws us to this time and place is this passage in 18, 12, 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. The sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. Now, some of what Paul is talking about is end of times, eschatological second coming, when Jesus comes back to redeem fallen creation, when Christ comes again and everything is as it was created to be originally and meant to be for eternity. But friends, we are not in that time yet. We know it. We are in that in-between time when Christ came the first time for his 33-ish years of ministry on this earth and ascended. And then we are in also this time of waiting till Christ comes again, the second time to redeem all of creation and us human beings as a part of it. We are in that in-between time. Christ came, Christ will come again, and we are right smack dab in the middle. And at times, it, this is a hard place to be. Our sufferings are great. We have so much that we have to deal with, so much that is going on inside each one of us personally, inside of our marriages, our friendships, our families, our churches, our organizations, our cities, our states, our country, our nation. There's so much that we would put into the suffering category as well, I hope, as so much that we would put into the joy, the growth, and the moving forward on this journey category. Now, when Paul is talking about hope, which he does all the way through this, it's not a blind hope that is more like optimism. Several, many sermons ago, we talked about hope and optimism. Optimism is more of kind of a secular, I just, I'm thinking positively, it's going to get better, it's going to get better, it's going to get better, or it's going to go away, or I'm not going to face this, I'm not going to face this. Optimism is to some degree shallow. Although what's good about it is that it helps you with a positive uh, mental attitude, and that is crucial, I believe, to negotiating so many challenges in life. But it isn't optimism that drives us or that Paul talks about here. It is hope. One of the things that Christianity has been criticized for is just this empty, positive thinking, some God will take care of everything someday mentality. If we go back to Karl Marx, who wrote the Communist Manifesto and influenced many uh, systems of government, of communism, um, one of his criticisms of the Christian faith, he talks about when he says, religion with these fantasies, meaning that all we're doing is thinking positively that something bigger than ourselves is going to magically take care of everything and we will never suffer. These kinds of fantasies drugs those who suffer and perpetuates their plight. Drugs those who suffer and perpetuates their plight. So that often heard criticism that religion is opiate for the masses meaning that we manipulate with our harmful theology that we just, we don't rise up, we don't do anything, we sit back passively and wait for God the magician to wave God's magic wand and the world will be made right. And even for those who suffer, it perpetuates their plight, Mark says, it makes it worse. It doesn't give them any positivity doesn't give them what Marx would say is hope. As a matter of fact, it takes and makes it worse. 
Now, for Marx not to be right, for Christianity not to be this kind of flight of fancy or pie in the sky, we just throw everything up to God and we will skip into the sunset, fluffy bunny kind of theology. What Marx didn't know was the suffering of Christ in addition to what he may have understood about the resurrection. And Paul isn't one to gloss over difficulty or suffering. Emil Bruner, who's a Swiss theologian, shaped a lot of our Reformed uh, Protestant theology, said that what oxygen is for the lungs, such hope is for the meaning of life. What oxygen is for the lungs, such hope is for the meaning of life. Without Christian hope, life is not worth living. So what makes it that thick and rich? What makes it different than what Marx says? What makes it different from just positive thinking and optimism? Well, one of the things is the suffering that Paul alludes to. Suffering and persistence. Suffering and glory come together through Christ. His glory came through his suffering, and we experience glory in our lives not without some degree of suffering. Those things go together. And anybody who tells you that the Christian journey is just one, again, that is all fluffy bunnies and sunsets and skipping off into the sunset, sunset with my buddy Jesus is doing harm because it downplays the reality of suffering in our lives, and it is real. You know it, and I know it. But Paul doesn't at all explain this away or give a shallow theology that Marx could criticize in that same way. Paul knew well from his own sufferings of his times of tortured, being beaten, being stoned, shipwrecked, almost dying several times in a variety of ways, imprisoned, tried falsely. Paul doesn't at all say, come on, let's hop on this Jesus bandwagon and all will be made well. Quite the opposite. Here, the hope that we experience as Christians is not just positive thinking. The hope that we experience as Christians is in what Paul calls experiencing the first fruits. Paul talks about it in our passage today. In the process of creation groaning, and the labor pains of creation not yet being redeemed in verse 23. And those not only, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. What does that mean? What are those first fruits? A very simple way to understand that is to say the first fruits of the Spirit are what God has already done for us. The first fruits of the Spirit is what are the promises that God has kept. The things we have experienced that we somewhat base our faith and our lives as Christians on. We were created by God originally as a part of it, uh, humanity, as a part of the larger creation of this world. All of the covenants and promises that God made with prophets male and female, with judges, with kings and queens, all the way through the Old Testament, all of the promises made true through the whole sacrificial piece of the Jewish Old Testament. And then finally, promises kept through Christ. Friends, if God was truly a vindictive God of wrath, even a God of justice, that means we would get what we deserve and God would never have sent Christ. How do we know God loves us? So many ways. But one is that God sent Christ. And because God sent Christ 
to be our Savior who endured the cross, as we talked about in our assurance of pardon this morning, was raised on Easter, we can come home to God when we turn and repent, when we confess our sins, when we seek God with all that we are. Therein lies our hope. It is not a hope that says, if I pray to God, all of my troubles will disappear. It's not a frivolous hope that says, if I go to church enough, if I volunteer at the homeless shelter enough, if I read scripture enough, if I go to enough Bible studies and breakfasts and so on and so forth, that everything difficult will disappear. We are closer to Marx than we are Christ. But it is in this acknowledgement that we lean toward suffering. We don't run away. Sometimes we try to skirt and we can get through some of it that way. But there are times that all we can do is pray for God's presence, guidance, protection, and to help us hit something head on. And we need to continue to remember that distinction of hope. It is not light and fluffy. It is not just a frivolous word. Or Marx is right. Then we are just empty heaving thoughts of positivity into an, a godless ozone space and environment. But it's so different, and that's what Paul is making sure, that you don't lose your hope because we can already look at those first fruits and know that God is faithful. We lose our hope when we know that we haven't been redeemed or we don't know that we have been redeemed. We lose our hope when we aren't connected to God, to Christ, through the Holy Spirit in our life. We can lose our hope when the power of darkness becomes stronger than the power of light. We lose our hope when we try to fill ourselves with those things, those distractions in our life that keep us from letting our souls be filled with that which God has given us. Never lose your hope. It is, as Bruner said, like the oxygen that we breathe, Christ-rooted hope is who we are. Again, because of the first fruits that we've experienced, and if you in your life have not experienced those first fruits, and maybe you can't yet proclaim all of those things that I listed as God's promises kept, well, then you come on. Let's work on this together. And we will walk on that journey. That's a part of a first fruit also. Being given the gift of one another to travel this journey with our communities of faith and the opportunity to learn and to grow through the Holy Spirit, through one another as a church family. So come on, come on. Do not lose your hope. And do not choose and do not make and prove Mark's correct, that we are just empty and shallow with our Christian understanding on this level. Hope is rooted in our first fruits. Secondly, well, before we get that, let me finish one story in hope. It's a story a Lutheran pastor named Reuben Youngdahl tells it's about a young man while visiting in Dublin, Ireland, one summer. Young Doll noticed this young man had on his desk in his study a plaque with two words on it. The words were, but God, B-U-T space G-O-D. Pastor was so impressed by this plaque that he had one made up for himself and put it on his desk in his church. Visitors to his office would ask him, what do you mean by those two words, but God? He explained that in his hour of deepest need, he had learned to say, but God will help. In a moment of utter despair, he could say, but God, dot, 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 will give me hope. In a moment of loneliness, he could say, but God, dot, 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 is with me. 
when he felt insignificant and unwanted, it would help to repeat, but God dot, 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 loves me. That always turned the scale from despair to hope, from defeat to victory, from sin to salvation. But God, a reminder that God is always with us, proving those first fruits and second fruits and third fruits. So waiting patiently, we are so bad. We wait patiently for the redemption of all of this mess that we see. We live in this hope that we've just talked about, rooted in the risen Christ, with the acknowledgement that suffering is a part of this glory and that we must wait patiently. So what do we do in that meantime? We don't, do, we don't wait, none of us. I know I don't. Henry Nouwen, a wonderful Catholic priest, once said, if we do not wait patiently in expectations for God's coming in glory, we start wandering around, going from one little sensation to another. Our lives get stuffed with newspaper items, television stories, and gossip then our minds lose the discipline of discerning between what leads us closer to God and what doesn't, and our hearts lose their spiritual sensitivity. Waiting patiently is not a passive thing that we do here. Waiting patiently doesn't mean, ah, oh, tick, 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 tick. You're the clock. Come on, God. Come on, God. God's time will drive us crazy most of the time. So what are we to do while we, do we just wait in hope? No, we wait patiently in hope. What does that mean? It means that being passive is being actively working towards God's kingdom. Patience is not the same thing as acquiescence. Patience is this sense that we are not satisfied with the present, but lives towards a future promised by God. So being patient means we are actively working on kingdom living now. Last week was all about uh, sowing seeds. This week in Matthew about pulling weeds from those seeds as they grow. Patience is active. Many years ago, a pastor in Glasgow, Scotland named George MacLeod chance to look up at the stained glass windows over the chancel of his sanctuary. The phrase, glory to God in the highest, was carved in the glass. As he looked, he noticed that a pane of glass was broken and missing. The pane on which the letter E in the word highest was carved. Suddenly, he found himself seeing the words that were now there, glory to God in the high space street, S-T. High Street was, oddly enough, an avenue nearby for which those in mental, physical, and spiritual anguish often resided. It struck McLeod that the only way to glorify God is to glorify Him in High Street. The only way to truly glorify God is to glorify Him where we live, work, and play. So when we say we are patiently waiting on a hope rooted in Christ, it means that we are actively waiting. Patience takes many forms. And here Paul is telling us to be active in bringing about kingdom living. Be active and working towards others as, they, as we seek to share with them who God is, who the risen Christ is, and the joy of having that in their life should they choose. So friends, go forward today and no, do not lose hope. Hope is not retired. Hope is not dead. We live as creatures of hope and we breathe it like oxygen. And it is rooted in the risen Christ. It is rooted in the knowledge that suffering is a part of this journey that will lead to what Paul says is the glory that we can't even imagine. So hang on and hang tight. And know that being patient means that we are being called to active ministry to spread the love and light of Jesus Christ in this world. Hallelujah. Amen.